Thursday. All right, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, about 12.30. Um, <coughs> on behalf of the Senior Center and the geologists of Jackson Hole, welcome here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a brief, very briefly our speaker <coughs> here, Bob Beek from the Utah Geologic Survey. Mm -hmm. He spoke with us last night about the, uh, these three enormous landslides that he and others have discovered and are mapping, analyzing in, in South Central Utah, and he's going to further that discussion <coughs> here today. So mm -hmm. anybody, he also has some really neat rock samples yes. from um, various parts of these <coughs> uh, these landslides I think you'll want to take a look at here and ask you some questions about. Um, I'll just also mention that his brother Don is, is sitting over here at the, at the table as well. Come to see his, his what his baby brother is yeah. <laughs> with himself. So without further ado, Bob. Uh, yeah, you're thank on. you. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, um, as John said, I work with the uh, Utah Geological Survey. And I'm a mapping geologist, so I get to spend a lot of time outdoors looking at rocks and hiking around, and it's a really, really um, amazing job. And what I want to do um, here today is kind of share what we have discovered just within the last five years um, about some really interesting, truly, truly gigantic landslides. <clears throat> And let's see, so just a highway map of Utah. And you know, we've got Interstate 15 here, Interstate 80. Um, imagine some of you have driven down south out of Salt Lake, headed to Las Vegas. Um, but just to show of hands here, um, when you got down to this small town of Beaver, and driving on to Cedar City, who among you here knew that you were driving actually over the remains of some of the largest landslides known in the world? Anyone, probably no one. And that, that's not surprising because these were discovered <coughs> um, very recently, within the past five years. And they're so old and they're so eroded that they, they're just mountains. They look to us like mountains. They don't look like what we think a landslide looks like. But at the same time, these discoveries, I think, have a really important implications for our science of geology and kind of expanding our idea of what we think is, is possible. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is give you a sense for how three huge landslides that are collectively the size of Yellowstone National Park, how can those remain hidden in the landscape right before our eyes in this day and age? You know, it's, it's, I think that's a really interesting story here that we'll talk about. And then I'll show you some of the types of deformation that we see in these rocks that tell us that they were emplaced in three separate um, fast catastrophic events. And then we'll talk very briefly about um, what we think might have happened to have caused those slides. <clears throat> and so we're talking about this area we call the Marysville Volcanic Field in um, southwestern uh, Utah. And this is, the volcanic field isn't active today. It was active from about 30 to 15 million years ago. <clears throat> And today it consists of the very deeply eroded remains of volcanoes, cascade-like volcanoes and other volcanic vents, and three large calderas. Not as big as Yellowstone, but calderas. Um, so a big old volcanic field, and it's built, it turns out, on a really weak foundation of several hundred feet of clay-rich sedimentary rock. And that's kind of important to the story here. And what is also important is that this, all of these rocks, um, they're kind of nondescript gray and brown volcanic rocks. There are nothing real distinctive about a lot of these. And so they're actually hard for a person like myself to map and to recognize across the landscape. But interleaved within that volcanic pile are ash flow tufts that erupted from calderas that are on the present-day Utah-Nevada border. And those ash flow tufts, like a ye big Yellowstone-like eruption, <clears throat> they're very distinctive rocks. 
Um, so you can recognize them in the field. You can know kind of where you are in this big section of rocks. And they are erupted basically instantaneously. And so they preserve a record of what the landscape used to look like back when it erupted. Um, and so they're really, really important units for us. Um, <clears throat> The first gravity slide we discovered is called this Markagunt gravity slide, named after the Markagunt Plateau, where that remains of that slide were first discovered. Um, we discovered that in 2013 and first published on it in 2014. Um, two, three years ago now, we discovered what we call the severe gravity slide, um, named after the severe plateau, just north of Bryce Canyon National Park. Um, and these we can demonstrate, and I'll show you, that they moved from the heart of the volcanic field in the north to the south. And <clears throat> just last summer, we found another one. <laughs> we call the Black Mountains Gravity Slide. So this term gravity slide, think of it, it's kind of a special class of just really, really big landslides. And here's kind of a cartoon of a modern landslide. We all know what we've kind of seen modern landslides. It's got a scarp area and it's got a surface where it moves across and jumps up onto the former land surface and and flows out and creates all sorts of havoc. Um, these things are just like that except they're 60 miles long. So really really big things. <clears throat> um, so yeah, as John kind of alluded to, we've got three slides here just recently discovered. We know of, in the world, one other truly, truly big landslide. It's right in your backyard here at Hart Mountain. Um, that resulted from <clears throat> the catastrophic collapse of the Absarica volcanic field about 50 million years ago. And that's been known about actually for a very long time. And it is actually still to this day kind of controversial, that interpretation, that landslide interpretation. There's other ideas on how that thing formed. Um, but we know of four really big landslides in the world, all happen to be in the Western US. And so my kind of point is that once we realize that landslides like this can produce structures so large, they can be mistaken for, you know, true tectonic faults um, that, you know, we'll, we'll start to discover more of these elsewhere in the world and, and elsewhere in the Western US for that matter. Um, but they're, they're, I think, really important for their ability to really stretch our imagination on what is possible in, in this science of geology. And to give you a better sense for how big these are, just a very rough outline of the slide superimposed on this Google Earth image of northwestern Wyoming. We're sitting here in Jackson, um, Yellowstone Lake up here, the Tetons, the Absaricas. Um, these things are really big. Collectively, they're the size of Yellowstone National Park. And the volume of debris involved in these is enough, more than enough, to fill the Grand Canyon to the rim. So these are really outside the scope of anything that most people have kind of thought about in the past. <clears throat> so you might <laughs> be asking, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> these are really big. How come no one saw them before? And this is, I think, where the story gets really interesting because people had seen parts of these before. And this, it all starts back in the early 1970s, um, a professor at Kent State University, John Anderson, sent a student out to southwestern Utah to do his thesis work. And this is, we're standing on top of Brian Head Peak. You can drive up here to 11,000 feet and looking north, um, this is what you see, his old field area. And so this poor kid, knowing nothing, comes out here and starts mapping identifies this black ledge as one of these big ash flow tufts. It's 400 feet thick. Um, and back then, <clears throat> yeah, I think they did know it was about 27 million years old. Well, he gets to Sydney Peaks, and, and here he finds rocks that are 30 million years old. 
Okay, we're up at the very highest parts of the plateau. There's nothing higher around. Um, and so this is actually really weird. <laughs> it breaks that fundamental law of geology, they call that the law of superposition, which says that all things being equal, you know, younger rocks are going to be on top of older rocks, not the other way around. So a clue here that something really unusual was going on. And, you know, that poor student finished and John continued to send other students out here and they continued to find examples of this sort of thing. And eventually in 1993, John formally defined what he called this chaos of volcanic rocks um, that then was thought to cover some 200 square miles up on top of this plateau. They defined it and described it as the Markagunt Megabrescia. Uh, so just a name for this chaos of volcanic rocks. And they didn't, <clears throat> I guess, fully understand what was, how it came to be, but they, um, you know, reasoned it was due to landsliding of multiple ages and causes, um, but didn't know a lot more about it than, than that. Sir, can you talk a little louder? Yes. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I'll try to do that. Thanks. And so at the same time that John Anderson was working, um, the U.S. Geological Survey was working in areas to the north, kind of in the heart of the volcanic field, where the mineral resources are and where their interests lie. And this guy, Florian Maldonado, discovered and mapped what he called the Red Hills Shear Zone, that he interpreted all of the volcanic rocks were somehow tectonically detached from the underlying sedimentary rocks. And again, he mapped this out. <clears throat> it was not in the same area that John Ander Anderson and his students were working. Um, and he didn't have a really good idea for what this might have been. He called it perhaps a low angle um, uh, detachment faults or something, but you know, he had discovered something really uh, pretty unusual. And what this kind of reminds me of is this allegory of the blind man and the elephant. You know, in the beginning it was just so big and so strange that no one person, no group of people could really figure out what they had on their hands. Um, and I mean no disrespect by that. It took dozens of people, dozens of years, to start to map this volcanic field to begin to understand what was unusual about it. <clears throat> and of course, what was unusual is this Markagunt Megabrush in the Red Hills Shear Zone. Unfortunately, those researchers, um, all of that research just came to a, an abrupt stop in the mid-1990s because of funding cutbacks at the U.S. Geological Survey. They lost like 600 geologists um, during that reorganization. So all of this research came to a stop, put in the bottom drawer, people forgot about it. So a dozen years later, I come onto the scene, I work for the state, and I'm tasked with mapping this um, 1,500 square mile area between Bryce Canyon and Cedar City. And I knew nothing about any of this previous work back then, um, but I did my research and I learned about the Markagunt Megabrescia and Red Hill Shear Zone, and I contacted a lot of these people who had done that research, most of whom were retired by then, um, and, and worked with them to kind of bring this map finally to completion. <clears throat> and the second year of that project, I stumbled on exposures that none of those people had seen before that turned out had some really important implications for that Markagant Megabrush in this Red Hill Shear Zone and how those might be related. And so this is it. And this is, uh, like I said last night, one of my favorite outcrops in all of Utah. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but this is really, really interesting stuff. There's two different rock units here. Um, this, this lighter gray, um, fine-grained, volcanic plastic sedimentary rocks are full of volcanic ash and clay, very weak um, rock unit that this volcanic field is built on. And then on top, this darker brown unit is called the Isom Formation. It's actually the same 
formation that we just saw at Black Ledge, this 27 million year old ash flow tuff. And this is actually a normal section, um, the normal sequence of rocks here. And that's why I first went here to hike up here and to look at these rocks and to figure out, um, to, to learn about them so I could map their distribution. Well, it turns out when I got up to this contact between them, this is what I saw. And it wasn't what I was expecting to see, um, but two important points here. This, above this very flat surface, is the isom, and it is broken and crushed into sand and gravel sized pieces and then kind of re lithified. And it's underlain by this layer that we call a basal layer um, that behaved as an overpressured fluid at the base of the slide and was injected then as excuse me, as dikes into the fractured upper plate of this slide. So let's um, talk a bit more about both of those things. If you look at a, a thin slice of the, <clears throat> the isom formation, um, cut very thin and look at it under the microscope, this is what you see. And this is about a half a millimeter in diameter. This is a fragment of that really densely welded ash flow tuff. Um, but it's encased in just a ground up pulverized matrix of that tuff. So it's a rock unit that we call uh, cataclasite. And the thing is, the deformation at, on this exposure, as you go up to the top, you know, 30, 40 feet above, the deformation isn't that intense. So you'd stand up there and you'd think, well, nothing is unusual here. You'd map your contact and you'd move along. But, um, and that's actually what people had done in the past. They hadn't dropped down to actually see this. And this basal layer itself then is, is, is really interesting. It, it consists of just that ground up isom and the ground up brine head formation, both upper and lower plate, that looks kind of like concrete, really poorly sorted. It behaved as an overpressured fluid and then was injected as dikes into the fractured upper plate as it came to a stop. And this basal layer in the dikes are really compelling evidence of these overpressured fluids that serve to reduce then the friction on the base of these big slides and enable them to move really long distances. <clears throat> the base of that slide is also um, grooved and striated and fractured. Um, I like to think of them as prehistoric skid marks on the base of this slide. And that by looking at those, you can tell that that fractured upper plate came from the north and moved to the south. And so we find examples of this now all over these three different gravity slides, wherever we get down to the base of, of um, that basal slip surface. The, the thing, so all of those characteristics actually, let me back up. All of these features that we see on this gigantic scale, we see in, in a smaller scale on modern small landslides, even slides the size of this, this room, you would see these sorts of features. Um, but we found one unique and important difference between these small modern slides and, and these sort of things, and that is what we see here. Um, again, two different rock units, um, a sandstone and a volcanic mud flow deposits, lahars. Um, and that contact between them isn't a normal contact, um, but it's a fault, all right? And the fault is actually lined with this obsidian-like glass. And the glass is injected as dikes into both the, the lower plate and the upper plate rocks. <clears throat> And that glass, if we look down on the surface, I think, actually I don't have that slide, but most of it looks like obsidian. You know, it's a beautiful black glass. And it's something that we call a pseudotacolite, which is a really rare rock type that is known to be produced um, on the deeply buried portions of fault zones down at deep in the Earth's crust at, you know, five miles depth or something. And it's associated with um, big impact events, uh, meteor crater um, events. 
But I love to say this, this is the first reported occurrence of this pseudotacolite related to landsliding known in North America, in all of North America. And it's one of the few examples known in the world, actually. So it's a really, really rare rock type. And it's a friction generated melt. As these rocks are sliding one over the other, it generates enough heat to actually melt the rock. And this, you know, is, is really rare. So it's really, really pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> So what it implies then is that these landslides were not in place. They didn't just kind of creep along. They, they had to move fast to generate the friction to melt that rock. And so the temperatures we're talking about, you know, in excess of 1500 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, which is really hot. I've got a kiln at home. I do some pottery and you look in the kiln at those temperatures, things are glowing red, really hot. So probably in excess of 1500 degrees to melt that rock. Um, oh, and then it, right, it, it um, so, so what sort of speeds do we need then to generate the, the friction to melt that rock? And we don't know the answer to that yet, but we've got, researchers that are, are looking into that question. But the analogy I like to use is that if we were driving down I-15 from Beaver to Cedar City, on I, you know, going 80 miles an hour, which is the speed limit, um, we think this thing would have just rolled right over the top of you. That it was going at you know, 50 to 100 meters per second, over 100 to 200 miles per hour. So we think it truly was catastrophic emplacement event, events. <clears throat> So some pretty um, interesting uh, deformation in these rocks that we're seeing. And actually, I have some samples up here, too, that you guys are welcome to look at. Um, this is then just a cartoon of these three slides. This is Interstate 15 and Cedar City, if you know that small town. And uh, um, I've kind of been talking about this Markagunt gravity slide in green. Um, I want to jump over now to this severe gravity slide we show in yellow. And <clears throat> again, this we discovered in 2016. And I was kind of glad that my mapping project here was done. I was moving over here in a different part of the volcanic field. I was away from this landslide and I could finally get on rocks that had not been deformed, or so I thought. Um, to show you a spot right down here. Here's Bryce Canyon National Park. So there's, you know, several million people drive by there every year going to look at um, Bryce Canyon and it's just incredible hoodoos and red rocks. And you look north and this is what you see um, kind of from a distance, these kind of boring gray and brown cliffs. And well, I don't think they're boring, actually. This is, a, again, the Bryan Head Formation, this really weak foundation that the volcanic field is built on. And this is a different layer above it, not the isom, but what we call um, the, their volcanic mud flow deposits. And the cliff itself is, turns out, is one of these basal layers. And the basal layers, that, that the slide rides on can be really, really thin, or they can be 100 feet thick. They kind of pinch and swell. Here it's really thick. And what's interesting about it, you walk up to big chunks of it that have rolled down the hillside, <clears throat> and what you see, it contains these, what we call deformed clasts. And these are pieces of those really distinctive ash flow tufts that here have been crushed almost beyond recognition. Um, another example of them, but that have been kind of stretched out like pieces of taffy almost. And some of them have really delicate tail-like structures on these. And these apparently form through during emplacement of, of this slide. And I can't say, I, I can't really speak to how these form, but it's a, a brittle type of deformation. It's not a plastic hot um, deformation as, so far as I know, but really unusual um, class at the base of this slide. 
if you walk up to the cliffs, this is what you see looking straight up. They're kind of shiny because they've been silicified. But they, you know, they've been stretched out just tremendously. And it's, it's just really hard to fathom actually how these things form. Another example at the base of the severe gravity slide, we get big chunks of, of this lower plate brine head formation that are thrust up into the base of the Mount Dutton. Here's a little more close up of it, this white block that is, I don't know how thick that is, 30, 40 feet at least, but a big block shoved up into the base of the slide. Um, in, in places, the Brian head formation, um, you see a little hump here, there's a small thrust fault and a little fault tip fold. You see this distributed zone of deformation at the base of the slide. <clears throat> you, f you see these really interesting uh, injectite features. Again, that's material from the, the basal layer that's overpressured, that's injected upward into fractured upper plate rocks. And the other kind of really cool thing um, that we see, and I have a, a kind of a small example of that right here, our rocks, when we get near the basal slip surface or near subsidiary faults in these landslides, we find crushed rocks. And we call these jigsaw clasts. So you can kind of imagine you could piece that together. Um, but they're indicative of really high strain rates under really high confining pressures. And, and again, I don't know exactly how these form and they're not unique to big landslides. You find these on fault zones all over the world. Um, but when we find them, we know we are near um, some significant surface of, of slip. So, kind of interesting um, well, that looks like class. Brittle it is brittle failure, right, right. And what we think may be going on actually with these is that as that landslide is moving, and we've got a um, you know an old stream gravel deposit or these volcanic mud flows that contain big coherent class that for some reason not all of these exhibit that but you know maybe one in a hundred or one in a thousand will this sort of damage will occur and there might be one right next to it that's just fine so that's really weird but <clears throat> we think that maybe they reflect some you know really brief episode as this thing is moving along there's some for some reason some slight expansion almost like it's being blown up but can't completely disaggregate because of the conf confining pressure. Anyhow, some really neat um, and kind of puzzling rocks that we see. So again, here's our you know, modern little slide, what we think was going on, and just another kind of version of things in green. Um, <clears throat> but like a modern slide, and this to me is where it gets kind of interesting that um, this is where, you know, it, it contains different styles and degrees of deformation depending upon where you happen to be um, working on this thing. And, you know, John Anderson is, and his students worked on the, what we call this former land surface area. We, we got, um, you know, really extreme compressional deformation. We got these older volcanic rocks put on top of younger volcanic rocks. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey was working in the heart of the volcanic field where they were seeing extensional deformation and where they were seeing, you know, simple translation on this Red Hills shear zone. And that Red Hills shear zone is actually, I think, really fascinating because it bounds blocks, mountain sized blocks um, that appear relatively undeformed until you get a little window down into the base of the slide and you see all this great deformation and you can show that they've, they've moved. Um, you know, this is the ramp area um, where we kind of first stumbled into what we think is really going on. This is where we found that pseudotacolite. <clears throat> Um, where we find, you know, extreme compressional deformation and again putting older rocks on top of younger rocks and you get out here on the former land surface and all these things are being thinned and attenuated. But the stratigraphy that you see here, we can show that it came from north of the ramp fault. So some pretty cool 
things. And so we're, you know, basically the lucky ones that stumbled across the trunk of this beast and were able to put extensional deformation together with compressional deformation versus simple translation. And this is, uh, you know, kind of the model, I guess, that we have come up with. <clears throat> Just very briefly um, to kind of wrap up, this is, uh, you know, why did these happen? People always ask, why did these landslides happen? And, and um, it's a hard question to answer actually, but this is a, a, a geologic map of the volcanic field that's shown in pink. Again, it's about 70 miles in diameter. The severe gravity slide, the Markagunt gravity slide, and the Black Mountains gravity slide. And we can show that they were in place about 25 MA million years ago and 23 and less than 22, based on uh, cross-cutting relationships that we have with rocks that are deformed by the slides and then not deformed by the slides. <laughs> we know that it was preceded by um, slow gravitational spreading of this volcanic field on something we call the Ponsagant thrust faults that go actually right through the north end of, of uh, Bryce Canyon National Park. And that's a common process at volcanoes worldwide today. I mean, the Earth's crust just does a really poor job of supporting these massive, massive volcanoes. They just slowly um, kind of ooze out to try to reach some sort of equilibrium. Um, what I find intriguing <clears throat> is that the head of each of these slides, we have a major volcanic feature. Here's what we call the Monroe Peak Caldera. Here's what we call the Mount Belknap Caldera, and then the Mineral Mountains at the head of the Black Mountains slide. And the minerals aren't a caldera, they're Utah's <laughs> largest exposed granite batholith. But each of these are three major volcanic features that for some reason are found at the breakaway area of these slides. And like we talked about last night, we can't yet tie the emplacement of these directly to formation of a caldera. Um, there are ages. These calderas seem to be um, too young to have been produced by that slide event. You know, kind of think in the back of your mind, if you, if you take a big pile of volcanoes and you slide them away, that that's going to release pressure on a magma chamber maybe, and maybe you'd get an eruption straight away. Here we don't seem to have that happening. I have no idea why, um, but it's something that, you know, people are going to work on. <clears throat> so let's see, just to wrap up. Um, in 2017, we brought together um, my co-workers, my colleagues and I, Pete Rowley and David Hacker, assembled a group of about 30 people from around the country and a few from overseas with all manner of expertise in geology and rock mechanics and structure and volcanology and all this. Um, to, to, we spent a week on these outcrops and to see those people walk up to an outcrop that they knew nothing about and debate what the heck is going on was, was really, really fascinating. Um, there's a lot of research now that is um, ongoing as a result of this field forum. Um, we've got a new field guide uh, to these three landslides that will be published through GSA um, at the end of this year, we hope. Um, so a lot of interesting research that's going on. I'm happy to talk more about that if you'd like. And then just to wrap up here, again, these are truly gigantic things, collectively the size of Yellowstone. No one knew about them five years ago. And to me, in this day and age, that's really pretty astounding. And it begs the question that, well, where else in the world aren't you know, might these be looking? Maybe the San Juans in Colorado, you know, maybe in South America in the Peruvian Andes. I think they're around there, um, but you have to look, I mean, they're insanely big. You can spend your career working at the head of one of these and never know you're on something that has moved. So anyhow, it's, I think it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, and again, there's a few samples of before and after here, what happens to these rocks. If you'd like to look at those, I'm happy to talk about it. So 
appreciate the, the chance to, to share this kind of wild story with you, but if you have any questions, um, see if I can answer some. Why are the three slides so closely adjacent? Yeah, okay, very good question. Why are these three slides so close together? And <clears throat> that, let's see, go back just one. <clears throat> I mean, here's the volcanic field. Remember, it's built on this weak, weak substrate, but the, the, the volcanism in this field, um, the focus of volcanism kind of shifted westward through time for some reason. So we had the biggest development here early on. We had a big slide. For some reason, the, the, the focus of volcanism kind of shifted westward, and it did that three times. And these slides kind of mimic that peak development of these volcanoes and it got to some point where the crust just couldn't support it and they failed. Um, why it didn't blow straight away right there, which I would have liked to see, I don't know. Um, but that's, that, I mean, that's what we see so far. <laughs> Perhaps it was because you had eyes to see the first one, were working <laughs> in the same area and then you saw others. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people had walked right by them. Yeah, I mean, like I say, dozens of people have mapped out here, and, and normally you would spend years working right here. You might spend years working right here, but you don't work that big of an area. And so we had the luxury of having people done a lot of this work and were filling in the holes and then could kind of see the relationship between what they were finding here. And, you know, you don't think of you know, extension and compression and translation and s essentially strike slip faulting being related somehow. But in a landslide, a landslide, even a small landslide the size of this room, you have all these different styles of deformation. You've got extension and compression and strike slip faulting, oblique slip faulting. Um, so yeah, it's just approaching it from yeah, a, a, a new set of eyes, right, right, yeah, um, yeah, Sue. In looking at that mm -hmm. basal layer, some of it is very thin, some of it is mm -hmm. very thick. Is, is there any correlation between <coughs> where it's thin or thick and where it is in the slides? Yeah, there's, not that we've noticed, the basal layer um, kind of pinches and swells, and we think that maybe where it's really thin, this slide, it was, as it was going across the landscape, maybe hit some impediment, some low hill or something, and just planed it right off. And so we have a thin basal layer then, there. And then maybe on the other side, there's a little valley. And so that valley then is filled in with debris. And so maybe it reflects paleotopography, old, you know, this was, and I kind of, I guess, forgot again to say this, um, this, when these volcanoes were active, this was a high elevation plateau. There wasn't a lot of topography. There was this mass of volcanic rocks and then out way in the distal flanks was this high elevation plateau. And so there weren't deep stream canyons or other mountains that these things kind of would have been stopped by. So they just rolled out over the former land surface, you know, 20 miles or more before they finally lost their momentum and came to a stop. But, yeah. In, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about landslides, it, there's a thing in your head that that much volume of soil mm -hmm. would have had to have been quite a bit higher and quite mm -hmm. a bit higher in order mm -hmm. to have the uh, speed. Yeah. At, and at, and especially at the speed that you keep <coughs> going. Mm -hmm. So how high how high you yeah. conjecture that X, Y, Z, whatever it is, yeah. like, you know, uh, high right, whatever, would have had to have been, and also to not only have sent it at that speed, but that volume? Yeah. Um, the short answer we don't know yet, but we hope to get an answer. There's, there's new research going on now um, that's going to tackle the, some of those questions. We're looking at specifically paleo elevation, how high is high, um, and what kind of slopes do you need to have this thing run out on. And, and my best guess now is that 
given the situation we have here with this really weak foundation and these basal layers acting to reduce friction on the base of the slide, that we don't need much of a slope. You know, if you project a slope of one degree over 20 miles, I, you know, I don't know what the drop is, but it's huge. It's huge. Um, and so it's not, you're not looking at like a 15 degree slope. You're looking at something that for all practical purposes is nearly flat. Um, you need the volume. And so you've got this volcanic field, you got this weak foundation, and for some reason it fails. And that has got to be enough to, to give a push to this slide mass, to shoot it out up over the land surface and, and to let it ride out. But there's a very good relationship with modern landslides with what they call the fall distance and the run out distance. You know, there's a beautiful relationship and these do not obey that by orders of magnitude. They just go, go, go. Um, and people have talked about, <coughs> you know, why that is. What is it that reduces friction on those surfaces that allow that sort of run out? And, you know, hopefully we'll have answers to something like that um, years down the road, but. Um, Isn't it the liquid formation that allows that? I think it's the base That's of layers. The only way I yeah. Can imagine it. Right. And I agree with the way. Right. I don't think you need a big slope. If it yeah. collapses, then you have a huge mass pushing. Right. And if you have right. a liquid underlayer, it can flow forever. Yeah. And I think that base of layer would your, your would be. Model makes sense to me. It's good to know. <laughs> 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 Just one sec. The, the, I think the base of layers, you know, I think those form really, really quickly. When you start grinding rock, and glass for that matter would form really quickly. If you're at a depth of, you know, a thousand, well, what, it, you know, a couple thousand feet down, um, you know, that's a huge confining pressure. If you start moving rocks, you're going to form glass, you know, within you know, very short distance, actually. You don't have to go miles to produce that friction. But yeah, you had a question. I'm curious, how long do you think the landslide took? To yeah, the that's so, we've got a run out of at least 20 miles. Um, we think it was really fast, um, but on the order of minutes. And so, you know, with Heart Mountain people, some people don't, think that's the case. I think it's the case that that was another catastrophic thing, but some people think, no, that was, took millions of years over, you know, you know, a meter, 10 meters at a time, slipping like this. And we have no evidence for that sort of movement here. Um, we think it was really fast. And, um, you know, and I think in a couple of years, we'll put numbers on this, but um, minutes at best. Yeah. So truly, you know, truly catastrophic. Yeah. It's exciting. It is, yeah. Don, you had a question? Oh, just have you looked to the right of severe yeah. so that there's not okay. another volcanic? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, we got stuck on this one first and I got off it, I was happy, and then, you know, we found this one. Where I'm working right now, this is Boulder Mountain. This is Capitol Reef National Park over here. So Boulder Mountain sits up at 11,000 feet, beautiful high elevation plateau. It had an ice cap on it in the ice ages. Um, no, these rocks fortunately are in place. <laughs> good rocks. Those are good rocks. <laughs> um, well behaved. Yeah, yeah. Sue. Um, do you think that there is somewhere in the world that has <coughs> this set up? Mm -hmm. So that this could possibly happen within within recorded history. Um, really good question. I don't know enough about world geology because they don't let me out of Utah very <laughs> often. Um, but yeah, there's volcanoes. Um, I'm not so certain about volcanic fields, what fields might be susceptible to this if there's anything in the Andes that's built on a weak foundation, or, or I, I don't know. Um, but individual volcanoes, yes, wherever you look around the world, um, you s find evidence that maybe not the whole volcano, but, but half of it has collapsed and, and run out, you know, 10 or more miles across the former land surface. Mount Shasta in Northern California did this, I forget how, 50,000 years ago or something. Um, Don and I were actually just on Kilimanjaro a year ago, two years ago already. 
Um, and you get up on there and you look at these volcanoes and you look at volcanoes in the distance and everyone has a big scallop on it and a big slide at the base. So they happen. Um, they happen to have, you know, apart from like Mount St. Helens, um, that's a little different style of, of slide and placement. But yeah, I mean, they happen, certainly. Mount Rainier is, you know, people are worried about that from a more of a debris flow um, problem. You know, city of Tacoma is built on Lahars. on Lahars. But, but the, yeah, I mean, we should expect these big volcanoes to eventually fail. That's what they do. Um, you know, probably not in a, any of our lifetimes, but, but they happen over the course of geologic history, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Have you gone out and looked at our local landslide? <laughs> I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> I have not seen it. I've seen the pictures, but I'm going to do that. Um, um, yeah, so hope to do that. I have seen Heart Mountain. I was out with Dave Malone and John Craddock, two of the guys that are working um, on that in outside of Yellowstone. And if you haven't seen that, oh my gosh, <laughs> go to White Mountain. Um, it's along that scenic highway. You can drive right up to the basal fault, and it's, I think, there, their basal layer is like three meters thick of this just crushed carbonate rock. And it's got not those taffy clasts in it, but it's got almost like concretionary things in it, a result of growth during the flow of, of that slide. Really, really amazing um, things that they've discovered up there. But Gravant, I'm looking forward to. Are yeah. there any markings at that Heart Mountain? I mean, I've been <coughs> to Heart Mountain, mm -hmm. to the, you know, the historical mm -hmm. thing, but I didn't see any signs saying about anything. Oh, but there are. I don't I, think they there... They don't want you to know. Well, no. <laughs> I mean, they're not interested in geology. They just want you to come to the museum. Geologists yeah, aren't yeah. very social. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we spend a lot of time out. The out yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you got to have a reference point. <laughs> what I hope to do, actually, with these, you know, they're they're near um, uh, Bryce Canyon. It's near Zion Canyon. You know, how many millions and millions of people do this tour, and they drive right by the, some of this stuff. And so I'm going to work over the next few years with the Forest Service and the Park Service and get some signs, actually, and, and create a, a guidebook where you could drive to some of these more accessible places. Idea. And I think it would be great. Yeah. yeah. Well, they do that on that highway up to, um, where's, what's that highway where, where they have out of the, out of the, <laughs> the wall. Oh. Yeah. The yeah. Sign yeah. Saying this is By whatever Thermopolis yeah. or yeah. something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. 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 that, that is so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The newest modern media is to be able to download that verbally into an app. Yes. Somebody can have it on their phone and it can drive along. You just dip, dip, dip. We're working on that actually at the Utah Geological Association. I'm co-editing our annual publication, and that's on Utah Geosites. And so they're just kind of short little vignettes about something really cool. And we're, it'll be web accessible. We're working it to make it so it's, you can just pull out your phone and, and look at this we'll too. But those yeah, and yeah. But I agree, that's the way to do it, is to make it accessible so that mm -hmm. when you're driving along and you got your phone on, um, you know, it could tell you, hey, stop, look, this is what's going on. Yeah. That would be and neat. And you could, you know, in terms of marking it, mm -hmm. have embedded places along the line, like, that would set off the signal, like, okay, you're at 41. Yeah, yeah, right. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to make sure I've interpreted this <coughs> correctly. You're showing faults on each, each of those. Those, those lines? These, yes. Is that, yeah. Is that where the main portion of it then mm -hmm. failed and then the part that has the arrow on it is where it was deposited? Yeah, good. Yeah, I didn't explain that. This is the source area. This is where it was deposited. And so this is a ramp fault where it ramped up onto the former land surface. And this distance, um, you know, is about 20 miles. 
this one we don't have really well constrained just yet, um, but it looks like it's even longer than that. Um, but, you know, it's pretty astounding stuff to think about. <laughs> okay, Yellowstone has this major caldera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you <clears throat> people that are working in this sort of mm -hmm. figuring in the future, it will collapse one area, another maybe, instead of blowing up and um, sliding like these? I don't know. Um, Yellowstone... Um, I mean, Yellowstone is an, it's an active system, you know, it's, it's, you can watch, look at that hotspot track going all the way up to Snake River Plain. It's currently at Yellowstone, you know, it's going to keep evolving. <clears throat> It'll blow again someday, um, maybe not right there, but maybe to the northeast a bit, relatively. Um, but when calderas form, you know, they eject vast amount of, of rock and ash. And then what's cool on those, the inner caldera walls, um, people map gravity slides, big landslides, where the walls cave in. Um, it's conceivable that as those calderas inflate before they go, they could shed over steepened slopes. You know, you could shed slides. I don't know that that's happened at Yellowstone. It's but. not recognized. But then again, have people kind of looked? I don't know. I'm sure they have, but... Uh, I mean, there's a long way to look. You can look on the north and the south flank of yeah. the uh, Snake River yeah. Plain all the way to uh, the Oregon border. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, they've mapped it. Yeah. They dated it and they studied it, but right. I don't think anybody's thought about anything like this. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious. I mean, you get kind of an experiment up here in terms of three different... You've got three different uh, source areas and three different slide areas. So mm -hmm. what is the correlation between like the mass and the slide and what's underneath the areas, things like that? Kind of the common denominator among all these is that Brian Head formation, the base of the volcanic pile, um, 500 to 1,000 feet thick of these white, fine-grained, volcanic ash-rich sedimentary rocks. And so is the 500 the one that's got the bigger mass and the less slide? Or is um, the yeah, or is no I, don't, I, I don't think we see a correlation, actually. It's thicker over here, um, and it's thinner down here. Yeah, I don't know that we necessarily have a correlation with the thickness of that weak layer. It just looks, you know, it's interesting that you've got this big source area yeah. with the slide and a little source area with a big slide. Right. <laughs> And, you know, we're, yeah, come back in a couple of years. Maybe this will evolve. I don't know. It, these are brand new discoveries. And there's certainly a lot of work left to do on them. Yeah. How many people are actively <coughs> doing research in the area? So, yeah, just within, the, since 2017, we've um, kind of encouraged, there's a joint NSF proposal going in in the next month or so um, with researchers from five different inst institutions um, to look at kind of the mechanics of these things, how they move, and to model that and to show what, what kind of initial conditions you need to get that failure. I'm a mechanical engineer, so Okay, so that's what they're going to do. And they've got, you know, half a dozen students involved in that. And up until now, we've had about six students out just mapping in more detail and uh, to see what we can learn. Um, we had a student out this, this past summer. He spent um, three months right here looking at, at that basal slide and finding more pseudotacolite, more of this friction-generated melt that no one had ever seen before. <laughs> so there's a, a fair bit of, of new work going on. Um, which I think is really exciting because it's basically all over my head, you know. <laughs> it's pretty complicated geology. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. one, one student, I don't know if it was Zach or who, but mm -hmm. it was from uh, Carbondale, southern Illinois. But yeah, they had yeah. said you had gotten your 
master's from Northern Illinois? I got my master's from Northern Illinois in DeKalb, outside of Chicago. And that's what, that's we what I was guessing. Okay, DeKalb. yeah. What the heck is that? <laughs> it's out in the, well, it was out in the cornfields. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I got a free ride there, so it was a good deal. Um, and ended up actually doing thesis work out in Utah, which is kind of how I think I landed ultimately this job. So, Is there any uh, thought on there being comparable things on the north side of the volcanic complex? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, my boss, Grant Willis, um, maybe you'll have him speak to this group someday, but he's been mapping up here. And no, basically they've not found anything, but I think they're missing something. Because when we map, we take it kind of near the end of the mapping, we get people together and we go out and we look at all this stuff and get kind of feedback. And he took us to a spot <clears throat> where the volcanic rocks were, were basically vertical. They were cut by clastic dikes. And the deformation was like, well, Grant, what is going on here? And they kind of just, you know, don't really know what's going on. I think there is actually evidence of things, weird things going on up in here. And his take on it actually is related to this gray unit. These are middle Jurassic evaporites. So salt and gypsum, really mobile, kind of unstable stuff that to this day is still kind of moving around. Um, like salt diapirism in the Gulf Coast, for example. And so the geology here is incredibly complicated. And I think he, he attributed that deformation to that kind of salt tectonics. Um, and that may be what's happening. But, but yeah, uh, we don't know for sure, actually. Interesting question, yeah. San Juan Volcanic Field is bigger at uh, the same age. I went on a field trip led by Pete, Peter Lipman, I think, <clears throat> and with, with a specific reason to say, well, have you seen anything like this? And he said flat out, no. And I asked him if you looked for things like this, and you know, we kind of got talking about other things. And you know, maybe, the, maybe it's not built on a weak foundation, maybe the things are different down there and they actually don't, but it's on the Colorado Plateau and um, you know, I don't know. I've, I've only been there once, so I can't say. But I would expect other big volcanic fields around the world that, um, you know, people might now start to think a little bigger and to see how things might be related. Yeah. Hmm. You gotta look at the hand samples. If you but yeah, if you, a few of you, if you haven't seen these, um, and you, you said you were a uh, mechanical engineer? Background. Background, yeah, you'll like the glass here. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.